Hello everyone, Stephen here at TRG Arts. Welcome to TRG 30, our weekly virtual roundtable series. Now at the regular time, thank you to all of those continuing to register and join us for this week. What proves to be an exciting, inspiring and challenging conversation, I hope, for you to all join. As we begin, a reminder that you will receive a copy of today's recording of TRG 30. Uh, via email after the session. And uh, if you wish to submit any questions, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen is the place to do that. There will be time at the end of today's session for us to take your questions. And any that we don't answer, as always, our LinkedIn virtual network is the place to go. And our team there will be answering your questions. So uh, to no uh, time wasting, let's move on and welcome Jim, our CEO at TRG. Uh, Jill, I know that we're excited for today's 30 minutes, so uh, let's kick off. Stephen, thank you and welcome everyone again to our weekly broadcast of TRG 30, where we are uh, talking about the real needs for the sector and now moving into this period of time when we're focusing on how do we revolutionize the way we think, talk, maybe even feel. Uh, so that we can evolve our sector, boy, oh boy, uh, as we talk about evolution and revolution, I could not be more pleased uh, to, in, to welcome uh, warmly Oscar Eustace, who is the Artistic Director at the Public Theater. Oscar, it is such a delight to have you here with us today, and, and I know um, you uh, a little and enough to know that um, I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to just make sure that everyone in this virtual room who's coming from different sectors and different continents understands and knows a bit about your professional, uh, the professional you. So you are uh, the artistic director, of course, at the Public Theater, been there since 2005. You prior to that were in other, uh, led other theater companies artistically in Providence, Rhode Island at the Trinity Rep and at LA's Mark Taper Forum. Teaching has been an important part of Oscar's DNA. He teaches at NYU, has taught Brown in the Trinity Brown Consortium there and at UCLA. There, um, we're going to talk about the public um, with you, Oscar, um, but there are iconic projects that even if you don't follow theater closely, you would know um, um, uh, Oscar, you commissioned Angels in America in San Francisco at Eureka and directed its world premiere at the Taper and, of course, were the producer um, on the award-winning, Tony Award-winning Revival of Hair, Fun Home, Hamilton. These are just some of the things that you have been involved in that are public, and yet I think the things that you are most proud of um, are the are the other um, aspects of the public theater that we're going to be talking about today. And so as I uh, welcome you to TRG 30, thank you for being with us today. I wanna to kick off our conversation with a um, reference to a recent one we had where we were saying, boy, oh boy, oh boy, every week things change right now. And now is a time of change and big announcements and growing concern about the future. And we used the phrase, um, we're in this interval time in arts and culture. And you challenged that and said, no, no, we're not. We're still, we're still here. I'd love for you just to share your point of view about how and why it's important that we're still here. Well, as, as you know, Jill, this is an evolving stance for me. If you had uh, had this conversation with me four weeks ago, I would have stood on a soapbox and exclaimed to you that we're not a film studio, we're not a television studio, we don't make television, we can do a live performance, we can do it together. And I, I would have sounded very eloquent and I hope very convincing. And then we did something that really spun my head around. We produced Richard Nelson's Zoom play. What do we need to talk about a couple of weeks back, actually premiered two weeks ago. And we have got, in four days, we got over 60,000 views from 17 countries, 40 states. Uh, and the response to it was, from the public, rapturous. For me, I just knew that I was in the presence of an artistic experience. It 
didn't match up with what I'd called theater in the past because I was alone in front of my computer screen. But it was it was our mission. And since then, I've really pivoted to a position of saying the our job, no matter what the circumstances, is to continue to fulfill our mission in the best way possible. And we, in order to do that, we have to invent, which is what artists are supposed to do, right? So rather than say we're going into hibernation and waiting until somebody lets us gather again, what we're trying to do with the Aretha is go, hey, excuse me, the public, you took me back to my past there, Jill. What we're trying to do with the public is, is to embrace the moment we're in and saying, what is the best way to fulfill the mission in the moment we're in? Which, of course, we'll be glad when this moment changes. But men make history, but not in conditions of their own choosing, as Karl mm. Marx said. Mm. Uh, we didn't cho choose these conditions, but here we are. And uh, it's our job to make do the best we can. My colleague Stephen has joined, and so I know that the questions are coming in, and, and he's going to be jo uh, joining and asking. I just, I, to put an end cap on that, I've been observing that there have been a lot of questions about how will we survive. And what you and I spent some time talking about is moving from how will we survive to how do we serve during, during this time. And I know you feel that powerfully. Stephen, you're here because people are asking, and I know they're not asking questions of me. So <laughs> please. Jill, I just want to acknowledge, and we know that, that Zoom has been experiencing some challenges today with its server, and I know some of you may have experienced some challenge joining, and that's causing some audio uh, challenges. I just ask uh, Oscar and Jill if you could um, keep speak up and at a, a reasonable pace. That will really help everybody listening uh, engage um, properly. So, so thank you both. Meaning not to too fast. Is there we go, Oscar. It's just perfect. Okay. Thank you, and thanks to those that have just fed back. Hopefully, that's that's clear for you all now. So I'll I'll let you both both continue. It is a time. I mean, that too, the tech, the use of technology, whether it is, you know, the streaming of the Apple family or Zooming like now, um, this is a time of learning curves for even firms like Zoom. But this, this concept of service, um, how we serve during this time, the public theater has many ways of serving. How will you, and the public theater do that at this time? Uh, we will do it experimentally because mm -hmm. everything is new. When we did Richard Nelson's piece two weeks ago, we had no idea whether it would work, namely whether we would like it as art. And we had no idea if there was really an appetite for it. We did it and those two questions were both answered in the affirmative. So we're gonna do more of it. Mm -hmm. And everything we do is gonna have that color to it. We have to experiment, we have to accept that we don't have the answers, but that doesn't let us off the hook. That doesn't mean that it's not our job to continue to seek the answers. And I want to say something about the survival question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recognize the public is in a different position from many of the institutional people who are listening right now. We have always depended primarily on philanthropy. Our contributed income makes up just shy of 80% of our annual budget and our earned income is 20%. I know that's the reverse for many of you. So some of our lessons are specific to us, but the broader thing I would say is we have to demonstrate to enough people that we bring value to their lives, that they can't imagine their lives without us, that we can garner the necessary support to keep going. And that is true whether it's contributed income or earned income. We have to, and, and boy, do I feel like we are heading into an environment where we are all going to be tested because no matter what happens, we know we're in an environment where resources have been radically diminished. We're going to be, we may be stepping out into a Great Depression. We're certainly going to be stepping out into a period of greatest unemployment since the Great Depression. So the competition for resources is going to be fierce. And the way that I feel like we have to respond to that is to actively demonstrate in our work that we are bringing value that nobody else can bring to our community. And if we're not doing that, I'm not sure we really deserve to be supported. It's, it's, um, it's a really interesting provocation that you're offering here, this question of, are, do we deserve to be supported? Um, I convene executives every week, and I, I have been so bold as to ask the question, it, what, dig deep for your why. And if, if your community 
um, like ends through this period, if your community doesn't care about your resiliency, then your why isn't, you don't, you, you don't have it uh, right. And you have, you have um, um, thought about this why, not only in mobile units and other things that you're doing um, during the regular calendar year or season, but also in terms of partnerships and the ways that you're thinking about navigating through. This is a little sooner in the conversation but than we plan, but I, I, I like it here. I feel like there's a broader service why in the context of that, that and an idea for others who might be listening. Well, this is, for me, an example of the opportunities that arise because of a crisis. Because of this crisis, very quickly, we started talking to our public television station, WNDT, yeah. our public radio, WNYC, and the New York Public Library. And we just naturally all sort of gathered together and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And what we rapidly recognized is that what we are loosely calling a public consortium exists between the four of us. The four of us are all nonprofits who not only have public in their name, but it's there because our mission of service to everybody is central to who we are. So this public consortium is now about to unveil two or three pretty big plans that we are, I, I think, would have been fantastic anytime, but the COVID-19 crisis is what impelled us to reach out to each other. And my hope is that that's just one example of how this crisis is gonna open up ideas for partnerships, the need for mutual aid and mutual support, the need to combine resources in order to be effective in this moment um, yeah. that will last far beyond the the moment of sheltering at home. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to say that in the conversations that we're having, we're hearing more of this willingness, this incentive, this action, and plans are in, you know, in development, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be hearing them. Libraries, art forms coming together. Um, something, uh, something else that has been part of this conversation since almost you first started talking, and that's the notion of being nimble. Mm -hmm and agile and, and I actually believe deeply that we have an obligation right now, not just for resilience because we believe so much in arts and culture profoundly, but we have an obligation to artists and our teams, our staff teams and our communities um, to try to innovate. And you know, um, when we started this, when this, car, when this crisis started, there was a lot of, um, trying, uh, reaching out with free content, lots of distribution of free. And you've done that too. Um, I, I'm, 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 just, I'm reminded that um, you do have a funding model that includes philanthropy and that's people investing. So whether it's ticket buying or, or investing in, uh, philanthropically, people are supporting the public. But can you rationalize, how do you rationalize the amount of free content that is out out there right now with our need to be able to when we return say we're worthy of investment actually i know we give you all this free stuff but now we need you to start paying again well you know i'm, I'm a bad person to ask for advice on that particular subject because we've been giving away free shakespeare in the park since 1954. yeah um and the entire foundation of the public theater is based on giving away free tickets to the best the culture can offer because it's, it's not to stuff that's worthless. It's to Shakespeare. It's to Raul Julia and James Earl Jones and Meryl Streep and Al Pacino and Anne Hathaway and Audrey Mignot. It is to the best the culture has. And the statement there, is, forget the statement, the business model there that we have operated on from the beginning is that by offering this up for free and proving our value, that that is going to pay off in terms of philanthropy. And it has been strikingly effective for us for over 50 years, that people don't transactionally pay to get a ticket. What they do is philanthropically support the theater that gives away the free tickets. Mm -hmm. And for instance, one of the arguments that I think is the most powerful fundraising argument we have is that when you contribute to the public, 
you're not actually just contributing to the public, you're contributing to the city of New York because you're making those free tickets available, 100,000 free tickets every summer to all of your fellow citizens. You're making the mobile unit, which goes out to all five boroughs and to prisons and to community places. You're making the art form available to everybody. And isn't that what it is to be in a city? Isn't that the city that you want to live in? A city where the culture is spread. And I, again, that's not an... I, 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 I'm not so good at advising you about the, the how we go back to earned revenue, but I know that that argument has been a very, very successful business model for us. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's like the conversation that um, many people are having right now who are leading organizations in Topeka, Kansas, or in Calgary, or in Coventry. Sure. Um, and if you have, you know, you haven't always been at the public. You haven't always been at the public right. and you know and have worked in models where um, in the best you know at TRG we believe very much um, in relationships and curating relationships and transactional we, we would agree with you I agree with you the transactional orientation to the selling of our business um, moving to one that cultivates and curates and invites and says we're doing something exceptional here and we want to share it with you and we want to create ways for you to want to come back um, and sometimes that's a ticket a, um, price you know sometimes that's paying for a ticket and sometimes that's buying a membership and sometimes that's a, buying a subscription or making an investment one of the conversations that we're going to be having, and so here's maybe a question for you. One of the conversations we're going to be having in an upcoming TRG 30 is how do you reconcile if your business model is built on 60 or 80 percent earned income? And maybe you've been distributing free content and now you need to pivot back. How do you think broadly and generously and with evolution on your mind about income streams. So if you were to put yourself in the shoes of the uh, you know, executive director of the orchestra in Calgary or, or a theater company in, in middle America, what would you be thinking about now that might move in directions that you, Oscar, feel would be positive for the field around revenue streams? Are, are there some things that come to mind? Well, Again, you, you have quite deliberately knocked me out of my comfort zone. Oh. <laughs> so everything I'm going to say right now is not about what I actually do, but merely what I imagine I might do. Yeah. And the first thing is I wouldn't worry too much about giving away stuff free digitally and then charging for the live experience. Mm -hmm. because I think audiences will instantly and intuitively mm -hmm. make that distinction. Mm -hmm. They know that they don't pay or they only pay one once a month for whatever they see on a screen and they know they have to pay when they gather together live. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry that I'm sort of undercutting the value of my work by distributing free content. What, what I would feel like is that it's an opportunity to say, can I reach more people and can I figure out a way to make my art form more central to a larger group of people than it was before COVID? And it's that, I, I now have to talk about the theater because I do know a little about regional theater. Yep. One of the things that's been a distressing direction over the last generation, or actually really the last 40 years, is that there's many theaters that have accepted that their audiences aren't increasing, but they're trying to get more dollars out of each individual seat they sell. And yeah. that is actually their route to balancing the budget. And of course, it models our society where wealth is flowing inexorably to the top. And there's a certain group of people who are completely price insensitive. Uh, we, yeah. we discovered this around Hamilton, which mm -hmm. was yeah, so right, boy. When it moved commercially, there's certainly for a few years, there was literally no limit to what could be charged for the premium tickets. I mean, if somebody wanted the premium tickets, they'd pay ten thousand dollars for them. It was crazy. Oh, no, I didn't pay that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm really glad I did. But that is a certain class of people. And um, it's a certain class of people that is not going to be the only place we need to sustain us. And frankly, that certain class of people may not have that kind of income going forward. Well, so I think that, you know, to broaden our base, to find ways to have cheaper forms of access so that we may not 
extract as many dollars from each individual seat, but with a broader base and a broader base of support, there's both ticket sale dollars and an increase in the argument for philanthropic dollars. This is one of the, I think, fun, fundamental issues for now, actually. Um, I was in a meeting recently uh, where someone said, gosh darn it, how on earth are all of our, is, is all of our energy around equity and diversity and inclusion, how are we going to reconcile that when we're, when, we're, when we're fighting an existential battle? It's all just going to go by the wayside. And, 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 and I, for one, we at TRG have said, have said, absolutely must not be. This must be the time where we place that in the center and pivot. I know you feel the same way, not just with audiences, but with staff. There's no question. Is that this for me is a moment when we can purify and refine the values that we stand for. Under yeah. this pressure, I think every artistic organization is going to have to make some big choices. And the question isn't, do you have to make big and difficult choices? The question is, what are the values that are going to be reflected in those choices? And are those values that you are happy being publicly expressed as the values of your institution? When we have talked about furloughs, which fortunately we haven't had to do yet, but who knows? Mm -hmm. When we looked at a reduced size of our staff, the reduced size actually was more diverse than the larger staff that we were going to furlough. Because again, we have to make sure that we actually walk the walk. Now is, some, now is time for some action that helps us move this forward. That's the end cap I put on that. Stephen, now I know why you're back. And so I welcome your, your questions. Yeah, certainly this discussion has provoked some questions. And, I, and I, Lisa has, has talked about being uh, that so many of her philanthropists are either taking a hit themselves or coming to the rescue of other more essential organizations uh, that they also care about are on the verge of closing. So the question is, how must we shift with an inevitable decrease in philanthropy when the mission and the why remains the same? Well, from my point of view, your mission and your why may remain the same, but your tactics have to change. Your, what you actually do has to be different. Jill, you spoke about being nimble. Everything I've been saying now in the last few minutes is really about trying to purify and hold on to your values. But then on top of your values, there's a question of how you're going to execute those values. And the way you're going to execute them is got to be different now than it was then. And somehow, You've got to figure out how to make the argument to your stakeholders, your philanthropists, your ticket buyers, whoever it is that you count on for your community, that you are a philanthropic priority, that you are a priority in their lives. And if, if you can't make that case, I think it's going to be tough. I think you got to figure out how to. We call it the service why at TRG. What's the service why? Uh, an example, um, what is happening in the school systems? How can arts and culture help support schools or other aspects? Listening to the community it has never been more important to listen to your community than now. Stephen. I think that there's several questions around a similar theme here, particularly action oriented, which is, should I change? Should my goal be to change the ratio of my income to be heavier on philanthropy? Should I do that? Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'll take a stab first and then you can, you can pick on me, Oscar. Uh, I'll, you put me out of my comfort zone. How about, um, I, I would, TRG, I believe that um, uh, uh, investment by your community is the thing. So the question is, what's the right investment model? And if the, if the ticket purchase is oriented around relationship, it's not transactional, it's not designed to eke more income out of fewer and fewer people, then ticket buying in and of itself is a good thing. It says, I value what you're doing at your theater company, your ballet, and I am willing to invest in it. So on the surface, we would say ticket buying isn't bad making sure that you're nimbly confronting your revenue streams and thinking deeply about community and listening hard. That's what I would say. Oscar, what would you challenge in that? No, I, I think that's very clear. I mean, I, I feel fortunate in my career that as I have gotten older, 
I got closer and closer to the model that I now get to run, the public, where it's 80% philanthropic. Because that means we are, the argument that we're making is that the theater needs to, is a public good. And the theater needs to be available to people the same way books are available from a library, mm -hmm. the same way radio mm -hmm. is available, public radio and public television are available to anybody who turns on the TV. We, we are a staple of society. And that, that argument, it's been you know, 65 years in the making for the public. I'm just the guy who's lucky enough to pick up the baton and continue to try to make it now. So I think that model is an incredibly healthy model, but I also agree with Jill. We sell a lot of tickets and those, those ticket sales are important to us. They're important to our income stream and they're a way that people say they care about what we do. I've, I've often said that, you know, I will lose my job if I do free Shakespeare in the park and there's empty seats because it will literally mean I can't give it away. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Job to try yeah. to, you know, create things that people want to see. Sometimes yeah. the way to express that is by paying for tickets. Yeah, we've got to have people in our museums and bums in seats. And if we can do that and fund it, however we can do that authentically, um, that's, the, that's the name of the game. There are so many good questions. Um, we, we've recently seen public communications from large institutions that say, we are a live performance organization. We won't do art a service if we alter that model. How do you react to these assertions? You know, my beloved friend, Joe Hodge, just made one of the most moving videos I've ever seen that expressed exactly that. Uh, it was wonderful. And uh, four weeks ago, I would have been jealous and wish I could have made such a moving video. Now, as I said, my mind has changed. And how has it changed? Specifically, we can still make things of value for people. We can make dramatic works of value that don't involve a large group of people gathering together in one room. I wasn't sure that was true four weeks ago. Now I'm sure it's true. I'm also only sure it's true for the public. I'm not sure it's true for other art forms or even other theaters. But what I love about it and why my mood has gone way up in the last two or three weeks is we're back making things. And we're reaching out to the artists who are part of our community and we're asking them to make things. And my God, people are saying yes to me like they never have in my life. Artists are going, yes, let me do that. I'll do a play in four weeks. Let me write it. Let me go uh, interview frontline uh, workers. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. Let me uh, go interview frontline workers and create a piece out of that. Richard Nelson wants to follow up the apples. We're going to do Richard II. We can't do it in the park. So we're gonna do it as a serialized radio play with WNYC and every actor is on board because that's the other thing that we have to make sure that the artists who are our core workforce, the core of our institutions, get to engage and keep working. And what we have found is they're not telling me they don't wanna work until they can gather a live audience together. They're telling me, yes, let me create something. We've got time for one more, and I wish we could, really wish we could find a way to answer all these. Ben, welcome Ben, has asked, one of the common analysis of the collapse of Tower Records indicates it failed because Tower saw itself in the CD sales business rather than in the business of music distribution. In a comparable way, can Oscar describe the core business and purpose he is in without using the word theatre? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I feel like I'm a contestant on a game show now. <laughs> Uh, but, but the example that you just said says it all. We're in the business of delivering drama to people that allows them to see themselves in somebody else, to put themselves in somebody else's shoe, shoes, and to understand that the, um, the basic of life, the basic mechanism of life is conflict and resolution that how human beings move forward is they have conflict with each other, that thesis, antithesis, synthesis moves individual human beings forward and it moves society forward. And uh, I'm sorry I used the word drama, which was probably cheating, but that's the best I could do on short notice. It's terrific. It's terrific. And I'm looking at the clock and wishing we had a whole nother 30 minutes, Oscar, because I know there are additional questions that are coming through here that are really um, uh, on point. And so was your last point. 
um, we are in the business of connecting, inspiring, teaching, helping, serving. And if we can nim nimbly do that now, like you're inspiring us to think about doing, then you know all the better for our sector, all the better for our field. Um, I, I want to thank you uh, for just I, I, I'm, I just want to thank you. I'm a little overwhelmed uh, by being with you in this moment and your mm -hmm. spirit of generosity uh, for our sector and everything we're facing. And as we um, wrap up now and um, people are moving on to their next Zoom meeting, undoubtedly, uh, I want to take a moment to thank Stephen too and also um, highlight that next week I'm going to be joined by Zani Voss, who is the director of executive director of um, SMU Data Arts. We're going to be talking about impact on the field and next step actions. As always, um, you can join, please do, our TRG30 virtual network on LinkedIn. Uh, we will answer as many of the questions as we can and, um, and look forward to seeing you next week. <clears throat> Oscar, Eustace, thank you. Uh, man, keep it up. I just don't need to tell you that, but we need you. We need you what now. What a pleasure to be here. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. your work. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye-bye.